So as we said earlier, oral contraceptives are going to be a combination of estrogen plus progesterone. Like synthetic progesterone and estrogen work by preventing the estrogen surge, which will prevent the LH surge. Without the LH surge, what cannot happen? Ovulation. All right. So OCPs have many pros and cons, but in the end, it's up to the patient whether or not they want to use them, unless they're contraindicated. So the contraindications we want to be talking about are that OCPs should not be used in smokers over 35. That is the big one. If they're smoking, they're over 35, basically you cannot give them these drugs. You also have patients with a history of thromboembolism, such as DVTs, PEs, stuff like that. Or in patients that have an estrogen-dependent tumor, because you could figure as much that that's going to make the tumor worse. All right. The biggest risk you want to watch out for with people on OCPs are DVTs and pulmonary embolism. They're fairly common in people taking these. Their risks are just very much increased, so you want to be really careful about that because they go into a hypercoagulable state. Now, can you remember what hepatic tumor is associated with the use of OCPs? That's right, it's your hepatic adenoma. Here's a picture for you of OCP so you can see how they have the estrogen progesterone mix and there's like different days that people have to take them and that stuff. But the problem with the hepatic adenoma is that they're bad since they can rupture and cause hemorrhage. So just remember, no ovulation is how these guys work. Terbutaline and Ritadrin. These are beta-2 agonists. So... Their mechanism of action, MOA, is that they relax the uterus and reduce premature uterine contractions. They're also called tocolytics, meaning drugs that reduce uterine contractions and delay labor. They're used in situations where the baby needs more time to develop. Terbutaline has both beta-1 and beta-2 agonist selectivity, whereas ritadrin is purely beta-2. So besides being tocolytics, what else can these drugs do for you? Beta-2 activation in the lungs would cause bronchodilation, while in the heart it would cause tachycardia. As a quick cardio review, this 12-lead EKG shows sinus tachycardia. So how do you know? Because the P waves are upright and leads 1 and leads 2. And the distance between two R waves, example, this one and this one, is less than three big boxes. Ergo, the heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute. Moving on to Danazol. So this is another older drug that may show up on the boards, but all you need to know really about it is that it's a synthetic androgen that acts as a partial agonist at androgen receptors. So it's used mainly for endometriosis and hereditary angioedema. Now this image that we have here shows you endometriosis. It just really shows you different lesions that you can have with endometriosis like over here, over here, over here, and it's also showing you at different uh, time periods of the disease. In regards to endometriosis though, Danazol has largely been replaced by what drugs? The GnRH agonists. Remember earlier we were talking about luprolide and gosarelin. Those guys are the mainstay of treatment now. Um, other type of toxicity that you can expect from danazol are weight gain, edema, acne, hirsutism, decreased HDL, hepatotoxicity, and pseudotermo cerebri. Uh, this drug is contraindicated in pregnancy because it can cause masculinization of the fetus. Of these adverse effects, the really high yield one that you want to know is pseudotermo cerebri. This would present as a patient with increased intracranial pressure. It's really basically how you diagnose this disorder. Now, danazol and vitamin A toxicity are the two USMLE favorites as they both would cause pseudotumor cerebri. So be on the lookout for someone that has papilledema, for example. You can see with the blurring and bulging of the optic disc over here on fendoscopy uh, and other signs of increased ICP, such as headaches and stuff like that. Which serum is most indicated for the treatment of osteoporosis and postmenopausal women? Remember I said it's raloxifene. 
tamoxifen has that stigma of endometrial cancer associated with it, so we just don't put it with the uh, osteoporosis. Testosterone, as you would expect, acts as an agonist at the androgen receptor. Now, there's not much structurally different between these two, except that methyl testosterone, as the name says, has a methyl group added to it from testosterone at the C17 position. So, what does this mean? It improves oral bioavailability. That's the main one you want to know. Now, in terms of clinical use, testosterone is used for hypogonadism, and it promotes the development of the secondary sexual characteristics in males. It's also helpful in promoting anabolic healing, for example, after a burn or an injury. In terms of toxicity, though, we do need to know that adverse effects would include masculinization in females, such as hair on the face, on the chest, and male pattern baldness. In males, exogenous testosterone inhibits LH secretion by the anterior pituitary via negative feedback. Therefore, it could cause gonadal atrophy. In younger males, it also leads to premature sealing of the epiphyseal plate, so they tend to be shorter. Finally, testosterone can affect the lipids. How does it do that? It increases LDL and it decreases HDL. That's bad, not good at all. Uh, of note, when you hear about professional athletes taking steroids to improve their performance, this is what they're taking. They're taking androgens. So there are several ways that these guys work. The first one we want to talk about is finasteride. How does finasteride work? It's in 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. So it blocks out 5-alpha reductase, as you can see right here that it does in the image. This blocks the conversion of testosterone to its more potent form, dihydrotestosterone. So finasteride is used for BPH and male pattern baldness. The side effects that are likely to be tested on the boards include impotence, abnormal sexual function, and gynecomastia. Next one we're going to talk about is flutamide. Remember we talked about this one earlier. So flutamide is a non-steroidal competitive inhibitor of androgens at the testosterone receptor. In what circumstances did we mention it earlier? That's right, it's used with lupulite to treat prostate cancer. Now if you decrease LH and FSH synthesis via lupulite, while simultaneously blocking the effects of testosterone with flutamide, then you just hit cancer with a double whammy. Cancer zero, medical students two. Next one we have ketoconazole. So this inhibits the decimalase enzyme, which is responsible for converting cholesterol to pregnenolone, the first step in steroid hormone synthesis. This decreases androgen production in the testes, so it's used for prostate cancer. You may recall from endocrinology that this is also used to decrease abnormally high levels of cortisol and Cushing syndrome. Be aware that this ketoconazole is the only of the antifungal azole that is known to have antiandrogenic effects. Lastly, we have spironolactone. So spironolactone inhibits androgen binding at the androgen receptor. Uh, I really suggest you go to the renal chapter for more on spironolactone because it has a plethora of actions that we actually use it for. But in terms of the reproductive system, it, it's used sometimes in PCOS. Of note, ketoconazole and spironolactone are used to treat the hirsutism in the setting of PCOS. Like finasteride, they also can cause gynecomastia. So tamsulosin is an alpha-1 inhibitor. It's an alpha-1 antagonist that is used to treat BPH. It's shown here using its brand name, Flomax. If you think about it, if alpha-1 causes smooth muscle contraction, and now you have a drug that blocks it, you would inhibit smooth muscle contraction, thereby allowing for better urine flow. Now, why would we use this? It's mainly for BPH, meaning it has very little effect on blood pressure because it does not bind the alpha-1B receptors in the blood vessels. Can you name the alpha-1 selective blockers that do bind to alpha-1B receptors? The answer are the zosin drugs. So you have prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, which can all cause first dose orthostatic hypotension. 
Do be aware, however, that finasteride is the best answer for the treatment of BPH on step one. If the question also mentions the patient has hypertension, they do want you to put tamsulosin, not finasteride. Oh, that little blue pill. So sildenafil is a generic name for Viagra, shown here. Vardenafil is Levitra, and Tadalafil is Cialis, in case you want to know. So what these guys do is that they are CGMP phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, which were originally developed as actually antihypertension drugs. But during clinical trials, the researchers noticed that the drugs had a, another interesting side effect. Now this is a very important mechanism as it pertains to smooth muscle everywhere in the body, so I'm going to actually draw it out for you. So let's start off where you have nitric oxide, which normally breaks down GCP to cyclic GMP. Okay, so cyclic GMP is going to cause smooth muscle relaxation. Okay, so this can be prevented by phosphodiesterase 5. What phosphodiesterase 5 does is that it takes CGMP and breaks it down to GMP. Therefore, if you're breaking down CGMP, you're preventing relaxation. Drugs such as Viagra come in is that they cancel out what? They cancel out PDE5. So if you cancel out PDE5, you can't break down CGMP. Therefore, CGMP stays, especially in the corpus cavernosum, thereby increasing blood flow and you get an erection. Of course, these drugs are very effective in treating erectile dysfunction. But sildenafil and tadalafil are also used for what condition? They're actually used in pulmonary arterial hypertension because they can vasodilate. Side effects, the main one you want to remember is that these drugs can cause headaches. Because you also vasodilate the arteries in the cranium, therefore you can get a lot of a headache. And it's described usually as a pounding headache, which is a major complaint in the related nitric class of venodilators. You can also get flushing, dyspepsia, you can get hypotension, and impaired blue-green vision. By the way, do you remember what anti-tuberculosis drug impairs red-green color vision? Yeah, ethambutol. Good job. Of note, for the USMLE, if you suspect an MI, before giving nitrates, you must ask if this patient is taking erectile dysfunction medications because if you combine nitrates and sildenafil, you can get life-threatening hypotension. So this can get really bad really quickly. Do you remember, however, that nitrates aren't only given in MI, so you may be presented with a different scenario. This drug interaction, however, remains true at all times. Lastly, we have minoxidil. So this drug is actually a potassium channel blocker mainly used for androgenetic alopecia. And we all know it as the famous product, Rogaine. So it can also cause arterial vasodilation and may be used for severe refractory hypertension. But just remember that's the main one, Rogaine, for the male pattern baldness. A 63-year-old man with a history of myocardial infarction, chronic stable angina, hypertension, and diabetes presents his physician with a complaint of erectile dysfunction. He asked about the use of medication he saw in a TV commercial. He's currently taking metoprolol, nitroglycerin, lisinopril, and metformin. His physician informs him that it is unsafe for him to take medication for erectile dysfunction. What is the mechanism of the erectile dysfunction medication that is contraindicated in this case? Yep, it increases the level of CGMP. As we said earlier, the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors increase CGMP. So nitroglycerin also increases CGMP because it's a nitrate. So the combination of these two drugs can cause dangerous hypotension. 23-year-old athletically built woman comes to the physician complaining of multiple red ring-like lesions on her body. A careful history and physical reveals a woman has tinea corporis acquired while working on poorly clean yoga mats at a local gym. The physician prescribes a medicine to clean her erythematous lesions. After 15 days of treatment, she returns to her physician's office. While the lesions are clearing, she noticed that patches of her skin have become darker than normal. Which of the following drugs did this patient most likely receive? Q 
key to conazole. Like we talked about earlier, remember that this drug is an azole antifungal, so it can be used to treat this tinea infection that the patient has, but it has multiple side effects as it has antiandrogenic effects.